Welcome to the Property Management Show with your hosts, Marie Tepman and Brittany Stephens. In part one of our conversation with Tommy and Chris, we touched on how they were able to expand their customer lifetime value amidst area-specific market forces that tend to shorten it. Here in part two, we will cover how they balance profits, people, and the customer experience. Before we play the interview, I'd like to remind everyone that this podcast is brought to you by Four and Half Marketing Agency. We have been helping property managers with owner marketing since 2012, from strategy all the way to implementation. Visit fourandhalf.com to learn more. That's F O U R A N D H A L F.com. Now is the time to add pest coverage to your resident benefit package. CoverPest seamlessly integrates with your existing benefit package to give your tenants a world-class pest control service at a fraction of the normal price. Visit CoverPest.com today and mention this podcast to get your startup fee waived. I think the, the, the point that gets lost sometimes is that employee retention can lead to client retention and taking good care of our property management teams and employees um, is more likely to lead to higher satisfaction of clients and consistency of service. So it leads directly to client retention. It's, it's usually if you take care of the employees, your client retention goes up. But if you take care of the client retention first, doesn't mean you have employee retention. Well, that's a really good segue too, to talk about how you're retaining employees. You mentioned, or Chris mentioned a few minutes ago, the new role for your director of cultural, what what did you call it? Director of people and culture. Director of people and culture. I love that concept. And I'm interested a little bit to hear more about that role in addition to like what other things you're doing within your company to encourage employee retention. Yeah, so that role really sprung from the fact that we were growing so fast. We started four years ago, and we've grown to a company of about 25 to 30 employees within that time. And as you grow, uh, everyone has multiple hats on. Everyone is running in different directions, uh, all trying to help the company succeed. And this is a role that we thought was important to help Uh, focus our team on all rowing in the same direction, all focused on the same goal, as well as just realizing that uh, there is a work-life balance that's needed. And it's not all about work, work, work. Uh, A lot of us are are friends outside of work. A lot of us have been working together for for 15 years. And it's just once you have a a human aspect of the company, uh, that's that's so much more important than, than just focusing on what you're doing from nine to five. So uh, this role really has been uh, focused on just keeping our, our mind focused on that and, and not always about uh, what we need to do on a day-to-day basis in property management. Is that a role, a full-time job, that's the person's only job, or is it kind of like a two-hat thing? Yeah, so they handle a lot of our HR functions as well. Um, so I- any of our benefits and uh, payroll and all of that, but... Um, a lot of it is is keeping in touch with with everyone on the team, uh, making sure that we're all in in the right headspace, uh, especially going through these busy summer months um, as people are putting in more and more hours. So, do you have any goals with that role? Um, I mean, we talked about KPIs for the overall company. Do you have any KPIs specifically for employee retention that you measure against? Yeah, I, I love that, um, you know, how do we measure and get better at that? And it, you know, it hasn't surfaced as a problem for us um, yet. Um, however, it's, that's the classic problem is, is if you don't pay attention to it, that's when it starts to become a problem, right? So um, in terms of where we're headed with that role and employee retention, one of the things that we focused on is, is a timeline of reviews with our, our team you know, when's the most appropriate time to discuss um, their career advancement? When's the most appropriate time to discuss um, their performance? And it's usually not in the middle of what we call tactical season or the busiest um, season. And um, one of the, the pages I borrowed from something else that we had seen is that with Navy SEALs and Navy SEAL Team 6 in particular, which is the best of the best of the best, 
And they have a really interesting and very simple measure for who they want on SEAL Team 6. Um, it's, there are all these super high performers, and yet what other things do you measure besides performance when you're putting an elite team together? And um, with regards to their simple measures, they, they have a, an axis where they say, okay, uh, the vertical axis is trust. And the horizontal access is performance. And if you're, of course, in the, the uh, high performance, high trust category um, amongst your, your peers, you're going to be on, on the, the team. But what's really interesting about that is not everybody fit into the super high performance and high trust. And what was this? The next people that were enlisted into the team were not the high performers. They would rather have someone with high trust and the, the next degree down of performance than they would high trust the next degree down of, or sorry, then high performance the next degree down of trust. So um, that's one of our new measures we're looking at this off season is for everybody to just review each other, a 360 degree review of how much they trust each other as their peers um, privately with our uh, director of people and culture. And then for the leadership team to, to manage or, or measure performance and then to put plot that out and say, yeah, we can trust this person even if they're not performing super high all the time. This is someone that we want to carry on our team forward um, and also to see how they interpret the trust of the other others around them is really important feedback um, because we care. We, we want, you know, again, just to serve each other and trust each other. It's that it's interdependence, not codependence that we're looking for in our team. And, and also a couple other tools that we're, we're trying to use to improve retention over time is a, a profit sharing program with the company so that we're reserving a portion of the profits that are dispersed among the team. And that really helps us all focus on the goal that, hey, if we improve our customer service, um, if we're doing a great job, uh, in our roles, then we're should be improving the profitability of the company as a result. And that's a benefit that everyone on the team will, will see as the company continues to grow. And so one other thing that you mentioned helps with the retention is kind of the work-life balance. And I know that in a previous conversation, one of you mentioned your capacity to care ratio, one of your KPIs. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, this capacity to care ratio is, um, it started off with a very simple look. Um, and that was, okay, how many properties per person on the team or the staff? Not necessarily, different property manager, different models where some say, oh, well, you know, Tommy's going to manage these 40 and Chris is going to manage these 50 and Jessica will manage these 55 or whatever it is. Um, and they make it geographic centric. But what I really wanted to see was the overall staff, the overall team compared to the number of properties. And that's where it started this, okay, capacity to care. And what we noticed was the companies that, that had more difficulty uh, with quali quality of reviews um, seemed to have these uh, 100 to one ratios or 100 properties per person on their staff. And you know, I had been part of in early in my career, been part of teams that were 70 to one ratios or 50 to one ratios. And what we discovered was the longer, it didn't matter how good of a property manager you were, if you were overburdened for too long, you lost your capacity to care. That's, that's what burnout is. If you lose your capacity to care in your job. So how do we increase capacity? Um, so that's where it got more complicated was, okay, well, if we increase capacity, it means we could have a lower ratio. We could have 20 to one, um, you know, and, or we can support the team with more infrastructure. Uh, they could be, each person on the team could be more specialized at what they do, which improves their capacity. Uh, more experienced hires have tend to have more capacity. So, uh, it got more complex as how do we increase capacity? Um, yet our key metric for all of our company is understanding, do we have the capacity to care for our clients? And it's dual, It's a dual KPI. It serves both the clients and our employees. If they don't get burned out. They can deliver that better service to our clientele. So right now we're at 24 to one 
uh, properties per staff. And that's a little heavy on the, uh, on the investing in uh, staff ratio. Um, so I'm hoping we can grow to 30 to one over the course of the next year. And um, you know, I'm skeptical about going over 35 to one. I think when that, when we start to get there, even if the, the team seems very capable now, I'd like to reinvest into our growth uh, by hiring more people to keep that ratio uh, closer to 30 to one. I just wanna ask a clarifying question. When we're talking about um, 35 to one, are we talking about 35 individual units? Yeah. And that's, that's awesome. so yes, we're a single family home uh, rental manager. So uh, yeah, that's that 35 units to one employee. And that it's very different if you're managing a complex of 300 units in one building, right? That's, um, you can scale that much differently. Um, but for us, we manage a few multifamilies, six to eight units, six to 10 units. Um, you know, I, we still count that as one property for us. And so given the very low ratio of properties managed to a property manager or an employee, how do you stay profitable? Uh, you know, like that's always in the business owner's mind. Like I'm not running a nonprofit, but at the same time, I also want to take care of my people. So how do you balance them? Yeah. yeah I'd, love so to hear, I'd love to hear some of Chris's thoughts on this too. I, I would say um, my insight on this is, profitability is more likely, even though it's tighter, when you have better quality of service, when you have higher average rents, which we have, lower vacancy time, which we, you have, um, because the team has more capacity to deliver higher scores and improve on those um, important metrics, that improves our profitability opportunity. Um, and I'd always rather be hiring prepared for growth instead of waiting till it was too late and then hiring. Yeah. And I believe that employee retention as well increases profitability over time. And so by balancing out that property to employee ratio and making sure that our team has enough capacity and that they don't get burnout, out, uh, we're allowing opportunity and, and a runway for our employees to continue to improve their service, become more efficient, and uh, we aren't having to hire a new employee and train them up and get them up to speed um, if we have a high employee retention rate, which we believe that our capacity to care ratio helps with. Um, it is a balance between stress on the team and profitability. So we're always looking at it. We're looking at it on a monthly basis, uh, how, how we're tracking. And it allows us to plan for future team growth. So if we're growing our properties at a certain rate, we can say, hey, in three months, we know we're going to need to look at hiring a new employee. And uh, we know what, what margins that we can operate at and uh, that we're comfortable at. And uh, that's, that's something that we're looking at all the time. So now I'm curious to know how this capacity to care ratio that you're tracking so carefully affects your plans for door acquisition, right? Whether, you know, are you doing marketing? Do you have a steady flow of leads coming in? Or do you just acquire doors when you want to grow? And that's why it's easy to be like, we want to grow by this amount, we're going to acquire the, a book for business and then hire a person three months before that. Like, how does it work for you guys? Yeah, so we, we do have a pretty steady stream of uh, referral business that comes in. And that's our, our largest source of growth. Uh, so as Tommy mentioned before, majority of our clients are foreign service, military, and we have a great reputation within that community. So we don't do as much marketing as you would think because we have such a great presence within this community in the DC area that provides us this constant steady stream of leads. Um, we're also starting to implement certain referral programs with, with agents and brokerages in the area. And we do look at acquisitions, but when we are looking at those, we are, again, turning back to our capacity to care ratio and saying, hey, if we did make an acquisition of X amount of doors, what would we need to do in, in terms of hiring human resources to uh, manage those to keep our, our capacity to care ratio at, at what we're comfortable at? 
Yeah, I'd add to that and say, you know, they're so tightly related is the ability to deliver a high quality service. And, you know, I, I'd rather market a company that has high, high performance ratings and, and has a good reputation. It's, it's a lot easier to do that than trying to spend a lot of money on marketing to convince people of some, about something you're not. Um, we have a, a saying at our company, it's all of our friends become clients, all of our clients become friends. And um, we really, we do develop a relationship with a lot of these folks and we really do care and our ability to, our capacity to care is higher. So, I mean, it, it really turns into a very powerful referral machine. Um, now, we are, I've always been betting on growth. Um, I've always been betting on the principle that, um, you know, if we serve it, uh, these clients right, then they will recommend us and it, it will um, gain some momentum to it. Um, and just to give you some reference, we're close to 700 uh, units in Northern Virginia now um, based on uh, four years uh, in business, um, 700 individual single family home doors and seven, uh, in, yeah, 704 years. Um, then we also have another portfolio in, in Oregon, uh, which is a different experiment in property management, um, uh, but we have another 80 doors there. So you know, we're, we're close to 800 doors in four years. Um, so our bet on growth has worked so far. And, and uh, I believe that that'll continue if the sales market starts to soften, we'll have what we call the accidental landlord and they'll be looking for someone reputable to solve their problem when they can't sell, um, if that happens again, which cyclically it tends to over time. So speaking of reputation, your company has really amazing reputation online. And so how do you achieve that? How did you achieve that? How do you keep it up? Do you have programs in place? Do you have certain things that, you know, software that you implemented to make sure you always keep the reviews up? Yeah, um, it's amazing what happens when you ask. Um, you know, I think it's so often we, re we end up reacting to, oh no, you know, someone's unhappy. And, um, and then if you don't react to it, they'll, they'll make the effort to put something negative um, online. And you can't make 100% of people happy 100% of the time. So our good reviews are more about um, quick reactions and positive reactions to um, anyone who is dissatisfied or um, making them feel comfortable that they can come to us and that we will we'll be part of a solution to that instead of, um, you know, it's not a function of us being perfect 100% of the time. Um, yet, um, the other side of that is when we have done a good job, and again, we're building relationships with these clients, is we ask them, if we've done a good job for you, would you please Put a, put a positive review out there for us. It would mean a lot. And people love helping other people. You know, it's, it's not this customer service culture isn't all about what we do for them. It's um, some people love to say, hey, you guys have been great for me. You know, what can I do for you? And if, if you don't accept the gift of their willingness to help, um, then, then you're missing a good part of the, the review building process. The other thing we joke about is, um, you know, we, we're popular worldwide because our clients are military and foreign service. We have clients in over 60 countries around the world. And so we're like, oh yeah, like we're, we're, we're world famous, right? Um, <laughs> uh, and it's better to be world famous than every, uh, everybody swearing your name in every country around the world. <laughs> I really love how you think about that. So I have a question. When you're asking people, so I always like to get into the nitty gritty of reviews, but I love how you mention, and we've had a couple people we've talked to recently mention this too. It's like, it's all you have to do is ask, right? How do you typically ask for reviews? Uh, well, we tend to only ask for reviews when we know we did a good job. <laughs> um, but there, like when you, so one of our, um, our tagline on our logo is real estate with intelligence. And we do work with the intelligence community. Um, I'd like to think we employ the latest and greatest technology and do things in a smart way. But yeah, what that's really about, it's really about environment, um, sorry, environmental intelligence, that'd be nice. That's where we're going next. Um, it's also really about emotional intelligence. And 
paying attention in the communications. Um, so this emotional intelligence is picking up on those cues of dissatisfaction, picking up on the cues of satisfaction or, or people who, who express gratitude. Um, it's really incredible thing when, when you lead with gratitude, the responses you get too. So, you know, it's not just, oh, are you good at sending back an email? It's how do you send back a message? Or if somebody calls you, do you tell the administrative team, tell them to send me an email or wait till they go into voicemail? Or do you, do you say, yeah, I'll make time to pick it up because I have the capacity to pick up this call. You don't have to have the answer. You just have to make people feel heard. And then we can start to employ other tools of getting to a solution or allow us to call you back or let's document some of these things in writing because the phone call got, you know, really complex. Um, it's really not rocket science, but it's emotional intelligence that has earned us that reputation. And, and it's, it's our part of our process is, is how do we look at things and, and uh, respond with uh, emotional cues and leading with gratitude and being, you know, grateful to other people and it's, they'll, they'll follow you right, right into that message and tone. That's a really wonderful way of creating a culture for a team and making sure that, you know, it's not just a, a name of capacity to care. Like it, it is true. You are trying to inject EQ into the workplace and it, it looks like it is really paying off and congratulations on growing so fast in just four years. Yeah. Growth isn't without it's, you know, growing pains and you know that the, sometimes like, well, what are you willing to sacrifice and when you the growing pains we had i wasn't willing to let it be about dropping the service proposition to our clients so i was willing to drop our profits in order to hire a head of mm -hmm. that and you know again it's are we profitable yes could we be more profitable? Yes. And, you know, when we get closer to this 30 to one ratio or, you know, or above, um, we'll be more comfortable in that regard. Um, yet the other price to pay of stretching to be too profitable at the cost of the client and of the employee was something I was not willing to pay. And you think um, as we, continue to grow and us being a very data focused company that we would also be looking at ways to to automate but i think a real reason why we've been able to maintain our reputation and continue uh with our high retention rates is that yeah there's certain things that we automate but there is that personal aspect and that relationship with every client so we could automate our repairs line they could call and press one to submit a work request, but we have an actual human being picking up the phone every time and they can talk to our repairs department and get an answer right then. Uh, we could send out an automated, please review us, please give us five stars on Google email every time that we satisfy a work order or help them with a problem. But no, we're sending a personalized email uh, in our voice from our employees asking for that review. So there's only so much that you can automate before you stop start losing that uh that that relationship and that personal level of service that tommy was talking about yeah this you know this idea of you know it's easy to say oh we'll respond quick right and yet if you don't build that capacity to care ratio and build that into your business model you you've made it harder to do one of the things that you really want to do you want to respond quick but if you've got 80 properties or 100 properties per staff member, you've literally stressed the system to make it harder. And um, so you, one of the ways that we've gone about this is to create specialization in each phase of property management. So we literally have a team that all they do is comms. They're, they are more trained with this emotional intelligence and, this, uh, and leading with these customer service reactions and response. Um, and you know, their entire job is to get back to people quickly, even with if we don't have the solution at, at hand to know people have been heard. 
Um, and literally uh, three people at our company, that's their only job is to respond to comms with clients. Um, and we have other people where their only job is to coordinate repairs and their only job is to, to do inspection. So by going to specialization in each phase, we were also able to improve based on the person's specialty. Um, and we built in a model of saying, yeah, one of our core pillars of service here is, is quick response time. Well, you have to invest into, into that. That's a core pillar of your business. And we said, okay, we're gonna have hire a role that's only job is to do that and not get distracted by other things. And we, we have what we call, um, and this is also leads to those positive reviews is uh, what I call trust equity. And if you imagine a, you know, you're going on a long trip and you're filling up with uh, your gas tank, you know, every mile along the journey, that gas tank gets depleted. And you know, picture this, this gas tank as, okay, that's your relationship, how far it will go with your clients. And if you don't fill it up every, from time to time, then it just gets depleted and your, your length of time with that client gets depleted or gets cut short. So you have to build trust equity in the process. You gotta fill up that gas tank of trust. And the best way to do that, that I have discovered is truly by responding quickly and having this specialization in each phase so that people know these guys are really good. And even if it's not my job to do the inspection, they know that somebody's only job is to do the inspection and that my job is to get back to you quickly and let you know what's happened. I, I really think that a, a lot of the reasons why this personal touch is so successful now, even though that's what everyone did in the past, is because everyone shifted to the automated realm. And so now every time you call a company, even a government line, you have to be prepared to sit through so much, press one and then pound and then this and then that, that when you actually get a person it's almost a pleasant, it's almost a surprise. Like, wait, you're not a robot? Shocker. Yeah, shocker. Yeah. <laughs> so it's what what used to be the, the status quo, which is like, no one had the technology, so everyone picks up the phone. That used to be status quo, but now everyone has shifted to technology that it's now a differentiator. That's so interesting. Uh, Chris could probably speak a lot more to how we utilize technology not to communicate, not, not to deal with people, but how we leverage it within our team mm -hmm. so that we can deliver the personalized service and the technology. Yeah, there's a few things that we do. Um, not, I can touch on, on three of them, but one is we work with this uh, tool called Inspect. Um, that's inspect with a Q, um, I N S P E Q T correct. And what we use with this is, is we can go into any house and scan the barcodes and, and serial codes of all the appliances and systems in the house. And it creates this all inclusive, very comprehensive look at, at everything in the house. Um, it also, allows us to provide recommendations to tenants and owners. If a uh, water filter is broken, we can go on to our inspect app. We had already scanned the serial code for the fridge and we can say, Hey, we know this exact water filter is in stock at Amazon and we can order it right here and have it delivered next day. Uh, whereas if we had called a contractor to come out and take a look at it, they may have given us the same recommendation, hey, it's this water filter, but it took them three days to get out to the property and it's going to take them another three days to order the part from their preferred supplier and then another three days to get out there and replace it. So it allows us uh, to provide an extra level of value to our owners um, in that we know all the systems and all of the components that go into their appliances and systems at their home. Uh, that's been that's been really powerful for us. Um Another is uh, we, we utilize these minute devices, M-I-N-U-T, uh, and more so for our, our vacant properties and our second home management properties out in Oregon. 
But this allows us to install a device, uh, think of a smoke detector, and you put it in, in the home when it's vacant, and it measures humidity levels, heat, uh, noise levels, uh, so that if something may be wrong in the house, let's say it's the middle of the winter, and we can determine from that minute device on a remote dashboard that the temperature has dropped below 60 degrees. And uh, oh, it's continuing to drop. And now we're hitting into freezing territory and we're at risk of the pipes bursting. So these minute devices allow us to manage the home almost remotely. And it provides notifications for certain thresholds that we set uh, so that we know that we need to address a certain problem at a property or a potential problem at a property. Uh, the, the third is our director of operations is, is a wizard at collecting data and, and building out applications for our team to use. So he's constantly creating and tinkering with different apps. And you think that your iPhone has a lot of apps. This guy probably <laughs> puts, puts the iPhone store to shame. Uh, he is amazing at developing these tools that our team can look at and they can break down. Again, all the data that we collect, he has this all in a public place. So anyone on our team can go in, break down, they can look at the metrics. They can look at how they're performing against it, how our team is performing against it. And um, it also helps with us automate, not the external facing communications piece of our job, but it helps automate a lot of the internal tasks that we do, a lot of the repetitive tasks that we do. So those are three ways where we've used technology to really improve our level of service. And Tommy, let me know if uh, there's anything there that I missed. I, I, you know, I think that the greatest technology of all is, is the people. Um, and the mindset that we're operating under and you know our we have lots of themes and slogans and um, mantras and you know yes we believe in trust equity we believe in capacity to care real estate with intelligence and you know all these things aren't just things we say there's a process or a procedure or a technology or an investment from the company into our people through them and, and behind it um the people are the best part of it. And it's, it, it, is a, it is the people business. Technology can help so much. Um, so we, we decided early on, if we wanna do this different, um, we wanna build, build this magical castle, we're gonna call it Camelot. Um, I knew I had to have knights at the round table with me and we need to have a few wizards that knew how to use the technology at the same time. So, um, so uh, truly as, a, as gifts to employees who've gone through uh, at least a year, have contributed a lot with us, have um, battled valiantly with us um, towards bettering our company. Um, we gift them a, a sword uh, that's engraved Chambers Theory on the sword. And um, they're invited to be Knights of the Round Table for the long term. Um, at that point, hopefully they, they've experienced our team enough to know that, that we invest in our people and that through our service to one another, we create freedom. That's really wonderful. Uh, we got a lot of really good insights. Um, one of the big takeaways I have is a lot of companies have these mission, vision, these slogans. And it's one thing to have a vision that you tell everyone, hey, this is what we believe in. This is what we're about. But then the real proof of the pudding is what you do to live it. So like you said, we say we we ha we should have a capacity to care. And so we're not just saying like, hey, you, you should have a capacity to care. You should be empathic. You should have EQ. You're like, no, no, we're going to actually invest in technology so that you don't have to do repetitive tasks so that you actually have capacity to go out there and talk to people. We will invest in, you know, I'm assuming you have training and, you know, we're going to restructure the company so that you can specialize in the thing you're good at. And you don't have to pick up the phone if you don't want to, because you are a data nerd. So just be a data nerd. Yeah. Thank you for, for recognizing that. I mean, it's truly what we're invested in is, is our people. And um, it's, it's not just some fancy websites and slogans. Um, yeah, we, we do invest in technology and I, I can tell you, you know, I, I'm such a believer in the program we've built, but the leadership team, the Knights of the Roundtable we have uh, and the model we're, we're working with 
that I'm now more ready to invest into marketing so that we can say, okay, now we're past the word of mouth phase. We want to grow and scale up our business. We want to invest in marketing because the investment is already there for our people and we're ready to, and we can do more and continue to do a great job with what we have. And I already know that if we grow another hundred accounts, I'll be adding another two or three people. And that's, that's great for all of us. So, um, you know, growth isn't just for the company. It's, it's for the individuals in it as well. And that's why we do the profit share and we have a lot of fun together. <laughs> And that's all we have for today's episode of the Property Management Show. If you are enjoying our podcast, please consider leaving us a rating or review in the listening app of your choice. As a reminder, this show is brought to you by Four and Half Marketing Agency. We have been helping property managers with owner marketing since 2012, from strategy all the way to implementation. Visit fourandhalf.com to learn more. That's F O U R A N D H A L F.com.